Hare Krishna. So, I'll speak today on the topic of uh, emotionally healthy spirituality. And I'll speak this in three main parts. And I'll have some questions after each part if you'd like to have any. So first I'll speak about you know, two different understandings of how spiritual relates with the physical and the mental. That the body, mind and the soul, how the three can be dealt with separately as well as in an integral way. In the second part I'll talk about how the mind has its own needs and in scripture how there are examples of these having been dealt with. And lastly I'll talk about how this especially applies in the renounced order and what specific issues we may need to deal with. So the, <coughs> so the first point about the body, mind and soul. See broadly speaking, in the, in the broad Vedic tradition, the material and the spiritual are seen in two different ways. If you see the Bhagavad Gita begins with a radical differentiation between matter and spirit. It says that the whole second chapter is about how we are different from the body. At the same time, if we move further and further into the Gita, the Gita later talks about how the material is the means to the spiritual. That means, Krishna says, that Swakarmanatam Abhyarcha is the part of this, 18.46 it is quoted often that through your work, worship. So now this, some people also simplistically translate this as work is worship. Uh, that is not karma, karma in puja is not the point over there. If work were worship, then the donkey would be the greatest worshipper. <laughs> so that's not the point of the Gita. But the point, it's interesting what comes before this, when Krishna says, through your work worship, swakarmana tamangyarcha. But before that what Krishna is saying is, yataha pravrittir bhutana, by, from whom the whole creation has come, whole existence has come. And yena sarvam idam tatam, by whom all of existence is pervaded. So basically Krishna is saying, that don't re reject the material simply as mundane. The material is also pervaded with the divine. It has come from the divine, it has been pervaded by the divine. And thus, the material can also be used to approach the divine, to worship the divine. So the, so the bhakti tradition explains that the world is a resource to reach the source. The world is a resource to reach the source. And in this understanding, we see the so first I talk about differentiation. Matter and spirit are different. Mm -hmm. Then there is integration. That matter and spirit both come from the Supreme Lord. And thus the soul is here, the soul is here, the body is here. So first I differentiate the body and the soul are two different things. But then later we understand that the body is the means by which the soul can reach God. The body and the soul both belong, both come from God, ultimately matter and spirit come from God. And for the soul to reach the divine, reach Krishna, the body is a vital to me. But the Bhagavatam twice, there is this reference that if the body doesn't function, the soul can't be reached. Then, then, the, then the Supreme cannot be reached. The body is like a uh, like a tree and mukti or liberation or supreme perfection is like the fruit of the tree. Does anyone remember where this reference comes? Yeah? Shukracharya, that's one place, that's true. So Shukracharya is telling Bali Maharaj that you should not give charity to Vaman because if you give charity you lose everything and you're not going to maintain your body. Comes one more place in the Bhagavatam. Not exactly. 
actually there. It actually comes, uh, not exactly the same, the same reference, but similar reference comes in the section of Vasudeva and Dev, Vasudeva and Devaki and Kamsa. But Vasudeva adopts emergency process measures to protect Devaki. There also the idea is that Shariram Dharma Sadhana. So at one level, we want to transcend bodily consciousness. But at the same time, it's interesting that to transcend bodily consciousness, body is the tool. So we can't transcend bodily consciousness without using the body. Kāyena manasābhutya kevala yindyegapi yogina karma kurvanti sangam tektva kushuddhaya Krishna says. You purify all of this with the body. So now, with this background, if you see, where does the mind fit in? There's the body and there's the soul. At one level, is where does the mind fit in? Yeah, it interfaces the two. So we call the mind as subtle material matter. So emotionally healthy spiritual, this is the topic which I was talking about. What I mean by that is, just as we understand that the body at one level has to be transcended and the body, but the tool for transcending the body is the body. Similarly, if we consider the mind is a part of the body, the mind links the soul with the body. So at one level, we understand that the mind is the enemy and we need to distance ourselves from the mind and we need to not listen to the mind. At the same time, the mind is also a tool for us. And it's an indispensable tool. If the, if the mind is not functioning properly, we can't study philosophy, we can't uh, do our service properly, we can't relate to the other properly. So the mind is also a vital tool. And so if you want to talk about, say, physically healthy spirituality, what that would mean is that if something, if we are practicing spirituality in a way that, that, spoils the health of the body then we will not be able to practice for long say so some people are very vulnerable to cold <coughs> then if they are given a service which makes them go out in the cold and then you tell me you are not the body well yeah I am not the body but the body is a tool and the body will follow material laws so then that person's spiritual practice will not be physically healthy and then they will fall sick and they will not be able to continue the service for long. So just as the body, physical body has to be acknowledged, its limitations, its particular situation and spiritual life has to be practiced accordingly. The same applies to the mind also. The mind, each mind is different. And while broadly speaking we could say that the mind is our enemy and the mind uh, troubles us. But still, the mind is the tool that we need for functioning in the world. So, if certain things, certain things are not emotionally healthy for us. So, what do I mean by not emotionally healthy? Say, if somebody, is, somebody can't tolerate cold so much, and say so they wake up in the morning to do sadhana and they're trembling and shivering. And then somebody tells them, don't feel cold. <laughs> what do you mean don't feel cold? Is it? <laughs> That's the way my body is. I feel cold. Now I can decide that despite the cold I may go and do my service or whatever. But feeling cold is not a choice for that person. They will feel cold. And that has to be acknowledged. So similarly, each mind also has its natural emotions. Some people can be very sensitive. Little bit negative things spoken about them, they just feel very badly about it. Or some people, each mind has its own nature and <coughs> we tell person, why are you so sensitive? At one level it's true, we should not be too sensitive. But at that point, if that is the way the mind functions, that is the way it will function. We can't immediately change that. So when just as if we practice spirituality in a way that stretches our body too much, then it becomes physically unhealthy and becomes physically unsustainable. 
Similarly, if you practice spirituality in a way that stretches our emotions too much, then that practice may become emotionally unhealthy. And when this practice of spirituality is emotionally unhealthy, at that time, we start getting flooded with negative emotions. So, with respect to the body, when the body is stretched too much, it pains. It breaks down. So, when it breaks down, it can't function. So, the mind is something which, in a sense, never stops functioning. The mind functions all the time. But, when the mind is stretched too much, then it starts becoming <laughs> it starts flooding us with too much negativity. A simple example, you see that if we have too many things to do, if we are overworked, then at that time, if anybody with whom we are working does something, even a small wrong thing, we may get too agitated by that. If we yell at that person, or even if we don't yell at that person, we just feel too disturbed. So there what has happened, it is not so much that the, what particular mistake that person has done. It is just that we are already stretched. And the stretching may not be so much physical. We're physically not exhausted, but mentally we feel burdened. So the mind also has its capacity. Uh, now capacity can be in terms of working. Capacities can be in terms of, say, relating with difficult people. Enough. And if, say, we are working with some people and that person doesn't understand us. We work with somebody else, that person doesn't understand us. Two, three, four, five. We need somebody with whom we can understand, we can connect. So, understanding is for the heart, for the inner of self, what oxygen is for the body. If we feel nobody is understanding me, nobody is understanding me, nobody is understanding me, then we will start feeling choked. So basically when the mind starts becoming too negative, that is an indication that, that there is something which is emotionally unhealthy. Now, some people's minds naturally is negative, some people's mind, mind is naturally positive. As you say, some people are optimistic, some people are pessimistic. Sometimes if you take a glass of water and you ask, do you see this half empty or half full? When somebody asks this question, you may feel like seeing whether there is enough water to throw on their face. <laughs> Why? Because different people, they have their attitude. Some people are by nature more positive, some people are by their nature more negative. And it's not necessarily a bad thing. Because people who are more positive, they will be more creative, they will be more adventurous, they will be more enterprising. And people who are more negative, they will be more cautious, they will be more... Uh, more carefully planning things, evaluating dangers, and both dispositions. If, if negative disposition becomes the only disposition, then it's a problem. If positive disposition becomes the only disposition, that is also a problem. Because if you are too optimistic, you will not consider the risks at all. And then you will get ourselves in trouble. If you are too pessimistic, we will consider only the risks and we will not do anything. This is also a problem. So there is a normal disposition that everyone has. But beyond that normal disposition, whenever, our, whenever we become too stretched emotionally, then the practice of spirituality starts becoming unhealthy. And an unhealthy practice has effects. And the effect is that we become flooded with negativity. That negativity will feel that, oh, nobody cares for me. People are just using me. Uh, this person is like this, that person is like that, that person is like that. And when these sort of negative emotions start filling our mind completely, then even if we try to practice bhakti, even if we try to chant Hare Krishna, we can't focus on Krishna. So the emotionally health, unhealthy spirituality eventually becomes spiritually also unhealthy. This is the first point. Any comments or questions about this till now? Yes, please. Uh, two questions. Yeah. One is I was reading uh, that uh, your Gita lady that uh, 
uh, you mentioned that the mind, uh, we just don't have to uh, fight with the mind, but we have to get the mind to fight for us yeah. at some point of time. Like That's true. To, uh, so that I have point I like very much. Uh, because we finally we have introduced that tool to, uh, you know, just like you said, use the word once <coughs> So, uh, so uh, uh, my first question is, uh, how, how is it that uh, there is uh, some, you know, dichotomy, uh, <coughs> like sometimes, you know, uh, uh, and then this, to resolve this, is, is it to resolve this we identify the bad part of the mind as mind and the good part as, uh, like, you know, soul's decision or something like, you know, uh, and the true feelings or true emotions. And uh, negative ones to be okay, like okay, not ever calls Maner Manush or you know, sometimes we say Dushkarma. Mm -hmm. So usually the you know don't trust mind. Like, you know. So the negative aspect of mind is uh, treated as mind, and the positive aspect is usually I mean in a sense that's we can say that we, uh, that's our true emotions or the real. <coughs> okay, yeah, good question. Yes. This first. Yeah. So, shall I ask the first? Let's do this first one. Uh, let's do this first little, one. Little, little different. Okay, let's finish this first. Thing. So, when you say that the mind also has to be actually used to fight for the first operation, you can't just keep fighting the mind. So, how do we differentiate between the mind, this is the good part and this is the bad part of the mind? Yes, but the differentiation may not be that precise. See, broadly speaking, our emotions can come from three sources. Our emotion can come from our situation, our emotion can come from our disposition, and our emotion can come from a combination of the situation and the disposition. That means, say, situation means, say, it might be extremely cold and I feel it trembling, I just feel I can't work or uh, I might be extremely tired and therefore if somebody tells me to do this service, I just can't do it physically. So at that time I feel tired, the tiredness is an emotion. The emotion can come from the situation. Sometimes the emotion can come from a disposition. So why some people might just be very lazy. And even if they are, if now when, you know, even with laziness, there, the mind is such that generally the mind doesn't let us think bad about ourselves. Even if we go in a jail and talk with criminals, murderers, they will all have their excuses <coughs> and they're not just, they don't think they're excuses, they think they're reasons. Excuses means that actually you shouldn't have done this, but you did it and now you're justifying it. Whereas reason means this is what made me do it. So oh, this is what I responded. So anyway, so the excuse, so often what others may call as excuse, for them it may appear like a reason. So, so what happens? Some people are lazy at that time, they may actually feel tired. In the sense that the body is not tired. But they feel tired and they say, I, I won't do this. So it may be disposition. But in between is the combination of the two. So now it's not so easy to quickly identify whether a particular emotion is coming from the situation, from the physical reality, is it coming only from the mind or is it coming from a combination of both. So if we consider pain, to take a more graphic example of this, if my hand is fractured and if I feel pain, and now that pain is an emotion, but that pain is a pointer to a physical situation that needs to be corrected. But, say if I had a fracture and I have been treated with a fracture, and now I have to start exercising my hand, I have kept it in the cast, no movement, now I have to start exercising it. Now there also, when I start moving my hand first time, I feel pain. Now that pain is something which I have to acknowledge. But first time when I feel pain, when the fracture is there, I should stop moving the hand. 
But the second time when I feel pain, I acknowledge the pain is there, but still I have to move. I have to start exercising. So there, that means sometimes some pain is an indicator that I should not do this activity. And sometimes some pain may be there, and still I need to do that activity. So we have to see that, or if you consider a workout, somebody is trying to lift weights. So there is somebody is lifting 10 kg weights, that's their capacity. They try to lift 25 kg, they'll get crushed by it. <laughs> But even if they try to lift 10 kg or 11 kg, they can do it, but they'll feel some pain. So we could say there's a spectrum where 1 kg lifting you feel no pain, but there's no, no say, improvement of strength or body by that. 25 kg you feel pain and you know that indicates that you should not do it. 11 kg I feel pain, but I should still lift the weight. So basically, if we understand our situation and our disposition objectively and that requires intelligence so usually when we are in sattva guna when we feel a particular emotion we might, it's very difficult to process whether that emotion is coming at the heat of the moment to process whether it is coming from the body or it's coming from the just the mind alone so that time we might just do what 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 is appropriate or what we feel strongly to do whatever but later on, we can look back and observe. Okay, in this situation, when I feel tired, it really indicates that I cannot continue. But in this situation, I, I feel tired, but it, I can push. This is just mental, this is not physical. So that differentiation we have to do. <laughs> so when uh, we, we can't listen to the mind all the time, but at the same time, we can't neglect the mind also all the time. So, what does it mean neglect the mind? A Kshatriya naturally feels like doing, like fighting, doing managerial activities, leading. A Kshatriya can't be told to do the work of Vaishya or Brahman. Now, they will feel very choked, they will feel very incompatible, they will feel frustrated. And that feeling is also coming from the mind. But that feeling can't be suppressed. So, when we feel dissatisfied, Sometimes dissatisfaction can be just an occasional thing that keeps coming and going. And in general, there are so many things we feel dissatisfied about. This is not working right, that is not working right. But if there is a continuous dissatisfaction that is there, then we may have to think, okay, where is it coming from? And what do I need to do about it? So does it address your question? Okay. Yes. You also mentioned the working nature of the mind that if something very uh, uh, awkward or uh, let's say very, very pushing or tiring uh, is kind of mind is loaded with certain kind of uh, tensions, then uh, the body, if it is loaded with some extra things, it will just crash or stop functioning, but the mind doesn't stop functioning and it will create even more. Yeah. So my question was, uh, what is this system, like in a sense, uh, what purpose does it solve? I am mean, already negative, already loaded, what, what do the further negative things lead to? Like, I mean, okay. what is in this system? Okay, so when the mind is, uh, when, when the mind is stretched, then why does the mind overstretch? Then why does it produce more negative emotions? Yeah. What purpose? What so purpose is, this is generally, the nature of the world is that pain is a pointer towards something wrong. That is the broad way it is. So whether it is physical or it is mental, it is the same thing. When I stretch my body too much, I start feeling tired. I start feeling pain in the body. So pain is a pointer that something is not the way it normally is. And then we have to decide what is the corrective action for that. So if you are, say, doing a workout, and I said, this much pain I can tolerate, I can move on. But this much pain, it is too much, I can't tolerate it. So I have to better stop the workout. So same way with respect to the mind, when the mind starts becoming negative, that simply is an indicator that there is something wrong. And then, sometimes we may tolerate it and persevere. Sometimes uh, we may decide, no, this, this can't be, I can't live with this, I have to make some changes. 
So that again requires a tumor inside. So it's basically a pointer that something is wrong. Something needs attention. Now what that attention is, attention is, okay, I'm going to persevere or I'm going to change course. That is something which we have to decide the intelligence. Any other questions or should we move on? Yes, please. Yes. Did you mention pain, mental or physical? But in different cases, uh, there are different persons who can tolerate more pain, mental or physical. Some person who can. And from here, is there is tolerance power of us. And how, why there are such differences in the degree of our tolerance? Okay. This is uh, first. Second is that. Uh, Generally, so the soul is uh, such a and sometimes we feel pain. Exactly, who is feeling pain? Is pain is illusion or it is dream? Okay. So different people have different tolerance capacities, which is for physical mental pain. Where does this the variable tolerance capacity come from? And broadly, we could say it comes from past karma, as well as it comes from <coughs> present upbringing. That means that depending on the kind of body that we may have, some bodies can tolerate a lot of pain. Like say, you know the story of Karana, that when he was a student of Parshuram, an insect came and bit him while Parshuram was sleeping on his lap and he tolerated that. And that's how Parshuram concluded. Parshuram appreciated the fact that he had he had a such a service attitude. But Parshuram pointed out that all of you know the story, isn't it? Yeah. So Parshuram, so the point is that he recognized from that that you cannot be a Brahmana. A Brahmana cannot tolerate that much physical. Pain in terms of there is the Brahmana can do austerity in terms of fasting. But a painful stimuli like being bitten by an insect, tolerating that is there is something this much a Brahmana can't do. This is a Kshatriya. Kshatriya can, uh, even with the enemy's arrow, <coughs> pierce the body. And there's a lot of pain. The Kshatriya put aside the pain and still keep fighting. That's what is required for their job. <coughs> so by the kind of past karma that we have done, just as we get bodies with different tolerance capacities, similarly we may also have minds with different tolerance capacities. So sometimes some people, Say, if somebody speaks something harshly to them, everybody will feel bad. But sometimes some people just sink into depression because of one negative feedback. And others, they just take it, okay, accept it, think it about it and move on, process it and move on with life. So, we have to function with the body and the mind that we have. Right? We can't uh, immediately change either the body or the mind. So we understand that by past karma, this is what I have got, this is what they have got. And let's see how we, each of us can function the best. It can also be affected by our upbringing, our association. Say some people might be very excitable. Small, small things, they get very excited, very agitated by it. But if they associate with somebody who is always very calm, who is very composed, and that person may also become a little more calm, a little more composed. They may not exactly become like them, the other person who is bad, nature will <coughs> unflatter them. But still, by association, so if, if our upbringing was such that, in English there is a word called hyperventilate. Hyperventilate is actually, like we have ventilation, air. So hyperventilate, so when we get too excited, then we breathe too fast. So hyperventilate, is a word which is used to explain that we say when we get excited, we agitated, we breathe fast. So hyperventilate means to overreact to small situations. So some people have a tendency to hyperventilate. So say if somebody was brought up in an environment where the parents or elders used to hyperventilate, then that person may also do that. So it depends the past upbringing, the past karma as well as the upbringing. Okay. And uh, what is the second question? Okay, okay, that is a that is an eternal question. 
So who experiences pain? The soul is Satchitananda. Well, for, uh, first thing is that the soul is Satchitananda. But the soul's consciousness is currently caught in matter. Baldev in the abortion, in his Govinda Bhashya, commentary on the Vedanta Sutra, he says that there are two kinds of statements in the Upanishads. One is the soul never changes. And the other is soul keeps changing. So he reconciles the two by saying that the soul doesn't change, but the soul's consciousness changes. The soul's energy is consciousness. So like this is a light source. The light is here, the bulb is there. The bulb doesn't change. But if we put a red film on the bulb, light will come out red. If we put a green film on the bulb, light will come out green. So the soul's consciousness changes based on the kind of the body mind covering that the soul has. So now when when you say the soul's consciousness changes, this example simply indicates that the, okay the colour has changed. What kind of colour the soul is consciousness is? What kind of the light is coming out from there? It's interesting in the 13th chapter, uh, verses 6 and 7, when Arjuna is, talk, Krishna is talking about Sankhya, there he says, uh, Krishna is talking about Sankhya, he says, first in the 13.6 he describes the elements of material nature, and then he says, Icha Dvesha Sukham Dukham Sanghata Chetana Dhruti. Etat Kshetram Samasena Savikaram Udharatam So, Vikara, Vikara is transformation of Kshetra. Kshetra is the physical body. So, transformation of the body and he says, what are the transformations of the body? Desire, Ichhadvesha, attraction, attachment and aversion, happiness, distress and then he also says Chetana, Consciousness. So now, we know Consciousness comes from the soul. Consciousness and how is Krishna saying that consciousness is the transformation of the Kshetra? So here Krishna is talking about conditioned consciousness. Consciousness as we experience it is a transformation of the Kshetra. It is caused by the change of the material nature. So I without going too much into the philosophy, I give this background to illust- these two points I, unless I going to illustrate that the soul's bondage right now is real. And at one level, from the ultimate perspective, we could say the soul is Satchidananda and all emotions, all pain and the experience is unreal. But from a practical perspective, the conscious, the only consciousness we experience right now is conditioned consciousness. We don't experience pure consciousness at all right now. And that's why whatever emotions we experience in the conditioned stage, they are real experiences. Like say a child is watching a horror movie and a child is really horrified by that. So now is the horror that the child is experiencing real or false? Illusion. What do you think? Real. For the child, it is real. You say, you say the child is actually safe, nothing is happening to the child. But as long as the child's consciousness is caught in the horror movie, the emotion the child is experiencing is real. In the sense that it has it really affects the child. So of course it's a, the horror movie can just the mother can just turn off one TV or the child can just look elsewhere and the horror movie's effect may stop. So, but for us it's not like that. It requires purification. So right now, the Satchitananda souls, consciousness is projected into the body mind and through the body mind into the world. And that's why whatever the experience at the physical level is a real experience for the soul. So we can't say that the emotions are simply illusory. The emotion, emotions are arising from an illusory situation where the soul is identifying with the body. But that situation, that, that, can, that bondage is right now real. And because that bondage is real, the experiences are also real. So that's why the a that's why at this stage in the sadhana stage it's it's important to understand that distress is also real and therefore i need to rectify if we say that all pain is unreal then there will be no meaning to say that this whole is dukkhale when it is said that there's a vishwam purna sukhayate for the pure devotees how is that happening for them their consciousness is not fixated on the world at all their consciousness is absorbed in krishna so the child is watching the horror movie, the mother is next to the child. 
If the child sees the mother, the child hugs the mother's legs, then the child will fear no, feel no fear or horror. So the pure devotees who are absorbed in the Lord's mercy, Lord, lovingly, they, the consciousness no longer there in the middle. The horror movie is still going on. <coughs> but they are no longer watching it. That's why they don't feel horrified. But as long as we are in the world, the experience of emotions here is real. So we accept the, we understand theoretically that uh, the soul is Sachidananda and therefore we try not to get too carried away by the emotions. So I try to put this this way that we may have to live with pain but we don't have to live in pain. Live with pain means pain is a component in our consciousness. But live in pain means pain is the container of our consciousness. There is nothing else in our consciousness except pain. So sometimes when the painful situations there in our life, if we understand that, okay, I am a soul, I am different from this, so then we can understand, this is a situation I am experiencing, it's, it's the real situation for me, but this is not the whole of me. So some amount of distancing from the pain can be uh, made by understanding our spiritual identity. But that doesn't mean that we can deny or wish away the pain entirely. Okay. So, if we go to the second part now. The second part was that I was going to talk about how in scripture there is this point of emotionally healthy spirituality we talk about. Not specifically this term, but how spirituality does not, and there is no demand made that one suppress one's emotions for the practice of spirituality. We we'll talk about two examples. So when Arjun comes to know on the 13th night of the Kurukshetra war that Abhimanyu has passed away, Arjun just is shattered. He has fought a long day's war against the Trigantas and he is tired but he is wiped out a last issue of Trigantas. He is very happy about that at one level. But when he comes back, he starts noticing that nobody is smiling, nobody is looking at him in the eyes. There are no celebratory, welcoming uh, music being played. And when he comes into the uh, assembly, he looks around. All his brothers are gloomy. Their faces are shrunk and fallen. And he looks and he notices that the seat of a woman is empty. Stops beating. He just goes to Yudhishthir and asks him what has happened. And Yudhishthir, in great pain, tells him, Arjun is shattered, he falls down and starts crying, breaking down. And then, as Yudhishthir continues and tells what happened, eventually Arjun gets furious. And initially, his anger is towards his own brothers. And he says, all of your weapons, are they just like bangles? You couldn't protect a woman. He, he, he lashes out at all of them. And then finally he turns even towards Krishna. It's Krishna, you must have known what was happening. Why didn't you tell me? And he just keeps ranting. There's a whole chapter in the Mahabharata which describes Arjun's grief. And at that time, Krishna, <coughs> what is Krishna's response? Krishna doesn't tell Arjun that, hey, why are you attached to the body or something? Hmm. Krishna has told Arjun in the Bhagavad Gita, in the 13th chapter, that <coughs> Putra Dara Graha Vishnu. What is that? Ar- 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 Sunga, Putra Dara Graha Vishnu. Don't be attached. And the, in fact, even before wife, Krishna uses the word son over there. Don't be attached to your children, don't be attached to your spouse. So, Krishna doesn't tell him, hey, you forgot the Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> Krishna doesn't tell him oh, at that point that don't be attached to the body. Don't be at- materially attached. Krishna is very empathic and understanding. Krishna tells Arjun, distress comes in the life of everyone. But the great souls act in a way that they 
try to decrease others' distress, not increase their distress. Arjun, you can see your brothers are already mortified. They're already in pain. Please, please don't speak word that will increase their pain. So, Krishna actually is very understanding, very, very empathic over there. Krishna doesn't go into philosophy at that particular point. Krishna allows Arjun to vent his emotions. And then, slowly, Arjun processes the emotions. And after processing that emotion, then his anger becomes constructed and directed. Then it gets directed towards whom? Jaitra. And the next day, they are in one of the biggest victories of the Kurukshetra war. And Arjun single-handedly brings down, penetrates the whole Kaura ranks and brings down Jayadratha. So, here we see that Krishna does not dismiss Arjun's emotions. Even though they seem to arise from a material context. The context of a material loss. Dhiras Tattana Muhyati Krishna is told in the Bhagavad Gita. But Krishna does not demand that Arjun apply it immediately and not show any emotions. This is with respect to a loss of some a loss of a loved one. Similarly, when the whole incident of Draupadi being dishonored happens, and then the Pandavas are exiled to the forest, and then Krishna comes to meet the Pandavas. At that time, Draupadi, she breaks down and she tells Krishna, Krishna, I cried out to you. I begged to you for help. Why didn't you come? You may say, didn't Krishna come? Actually, at that time, sometimes in Mahabharata TV serials or movies, you might see Krishna coming and showing his hand and Sasari coming from his hand or something like that. But there, no, in the actual assembly, nobody understood what happened. It was just that Draupadi Sari didn't end. Single cloth that he was wearing, he just became exhausted. And they thought that this is, people thought this is because of her chastity that she couldn't dissolve. So nobody saw Krishna over there. So Draupadi, she said, Krishna, why didn't you come? And she says, Krishna, I'm your friend, I'm your devotee, I'm your relative. I deserved your protection. Why did you protect me? And now, what does Krishna do at that time? At that time, Krishna doesn't say, my plan is perfect. How dare you question my plan? Mm -hmm. There is this, uh, sometimes in shops and other places, people put this Gita Sar. So, this Gita Sar. <laughs> जो हुआ वो अच्छा हो रहा है, जो हो रहा है वो भी अच्छा हो रहा है, जो होने वाला है वो भी अच्छा ही होगा। Whatever happened, what is happening, what will happen, it's all good. I have read the Bhagavad Gita many times. There is no verse in the Gita which says this. There is no verse in the Gita which says this. So, the point is not whether it is true or not. There is a different issue which we can discuss. But the point is the Gita doesn't say this. What the Gita's thrust is that, not what is happening, but what we are doing, how we are responding. So, Krishna, at that time, he takes a very human kind of response. Krishna says, I didn't know this was happening. He says, if I had known, I would have come immediately. Krishna said that this demon, Shalva, Shalya or Shalva? Shalva. 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 The Shalva had attacked Dwarka and he had like so much devastation over there. And I was busy defending Dwarka. And as soon as I came to know, I immediately rushed him. So, and then he consoles us. Those who have dishonored you, your tears will never go in vain. They will be punished. Oh, Panchali, keep on. <laughs> so Krishna here also doesn't go into philosophy. Krishna is very understanding. Krishna gives an understandable explanation and consoling. 
So in general, in scripture, emotions are not wished away or emotions are not dismissed in the name of philosophy. As far as I have seen, I haven't seen any, any setting in scripture where a person is suffering and somebody comes and tells them that you are suffering because of your own karma. They may say like, that, oh, it's my, I don't know what unknown karma, what karma I have done because I am suffering. But whenever anybody is in distress, others actually try to help them overcome the distress. They don't say that it's just your own karma because of which you are suffering. It is insensitive and it is inappropriate. Because there is a time to educate and there is a time to commiserate. Commiserate means to share the sorrow of others and help them deal with the sorrow. Well, there is a time to educate, no doubt. But through these various examples, the point I'm making is that when people are going through certain emotions, those emotions need to be acknowledged. And they need to be dealt with appropriately. And sometimes speaking philosophy is uh, also a way of dealing with those emotions. <coughs> but the point is not just to speak the philosophy. The point is to help the person deal with the emotion. And sometimes philosophy may not be required at all to deal with the emotion. What may be required is just to be there to share their pain. So if we are there, then, so then we can actually be a part of the solution. And uh, I remember that it was in South India, there was this village which is completely devastated by natural calamity. And then after that, some, some teacher who went there and he spoke that all of you are suffering your own karma. <clears throat> and then after that, a Christian preacher went there and just offered help. And like the whole village immediately became Christian. In fact, this is one of the main criticisms of Christianity against Hinduism. They say that in the name of karma, there is no, there is no concern for social justice. There is no concern to help people who are in pain come out of their pain. And that's why the inequality and all this is being uh, perpetuated in India. Now, of course, that's only a part of the story. But the point is that when people are going through pain, their emotions need to be acknowledged and dealt with appropriately. And there is abandoned examples in scripture where philosophy alone is not used to dismiss people's emotions. There are, there are situations where uh, that, that can be done. Say for example, in Chitraket past time, when <clears throat> he's, he's distressed, he has come and illuminate. Uh, that is a particular situation where Fallena Parichayati, the result is positive. But most people, when they have lost someone, at that time, how best to help them will vary from person to person. So, any questions to me about this? Anyone else? <laughs> okay. Yes, sir. I just wanted to uh, check whether this uh, understanding is correct. Like, uh, so this means that what helps the person best, whether uh, uh, I mean, uh, addressing his emotions and becoming uh, empathetic, or uh, uh, whatever raises his consciousness from correct. his situation. Like, uh, just two more examples came to my mind. One example there, uh, the queens are lamenting over the king. And, and uh, Yamaraj comes as Brahman boy and he kind of chastises them saying that, not chastises them, but uh, saying that why are you crying, like you are also under the same, uh, uh, what to say, uh, situation, like you know, uh, it's like some, what is that, uh, hunter, uh, yeah, the story comes yeah, yeah. So there he uh, kind of, uh, uh, that doesn't let them vent their emotions but kind of guides them through like coming to the higher 
consciousness of uh, being aware of reality and also another place where uh, the Mahaprabhu is dancing and the son of Shiva dies and uh, all the relatives are crying and then Shiva Stapa says if you went out your emotions I will drown myself in Ganges because I don't want to disturb the uh, Mahaprabhu's uh, uh, kirtan. Uh, so, uh, so just a thought came to mind and the uh, many places where the emotions are addressed not philosophy yeah, is not true. insensitively yeah. present here. So what, can we say that uh, whether, uh, can, can we just uh, do something which fits best for that situation? Yeah. So, okay, there are, I mean, you go to examples of where philosophy is helped to, used to mm, transcend the loss of death, death. Yes. The important point here is that it's like a doctor administering treatment. So what treatment works for whom? Sometimes if a patient is too much in pain, and that when the doctor first says you're a painkiller, then they can do the medicine. Sometimes the doctor patient is not so much in pain, just do the medicine behind their cure. So it's not that we are saying the med philosophy is not like the medicine. But Sometimes the patient has to be at a particular level to take the medicine. And the, even the being empathic, these are not the ultimate solutions. The ultimate solution is to become Krishna conscious. But sometimes if a patient is in so much pain and there's no pain medication given, it's like if surgery is to be done. And if no anesthesia is given before surgery. Already horribly painful. So now the anesthesia is not the substitute for the surgery. But we can't just remove the anesthesia at all and just directly do the surgery. So basically there has to be a balanced program where there is a time for educating and another time for commiserating. In today's psychology they say that the people when they are facing loss, you go through different phases. First is denial. Mm -hmm. no, this is that person not died actually at all. Then there's anger. Then there is hopelessness. It's not necessarily this sequence. Then gradually there's acceptance. So they, they, people need time for grieving. So in the Bhagavatam also it is said that after the Purukshitra war got over, they Pandas performed the last rites and they grieved for the loss of their loved ones. In the Ramayana also it is said that when Dashrat Maharaj passed away, uh, they arranged, they announced a <coughs> nationwide period of mourning for the deceased king. So, grief, lamenting is unwanted, but grieving is essential for processing the emotion of loss and then moving ahead in life. So, it's a, uh, it's again like if somebody is wounded, there is a time when you need to, if the hand is fractured, the time when you need to rest the hand. And then after that, there's a time when we need to exercise the hand. So, if when the time a hand is to be rested, at that time you don't rest it at all, it will become worse. But if after the time, after the hand is adequately rested, then you don't exercise it. Then also it will be a problem, hand is still like that. So, if one doesn't grieve at all, all that emotion is there, that loss, the feeling of loss is there, one doesn't grieve at all, that's like not acknowledging the hand is fractured. But if one just keeps grieving, 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 grieving and doesn't move forward in that, that's like, okay, now it's over, now we have to grow from it, we have to move on, life moves on, so we have to start exercising. So we have to avoid both extremes of denying emotions and valuing in the emotions. So just one, uh, so then uh, with Bhakti Rasamrasan, in that it comes that one of the limbs, uh, 20 uh, limbs is not letting uh, ourselves be caught up in devotions like Shoka, Lamentation, <coughs> of the tw 10 non-do's of uh, the door of devotions and this, first 20. Uh, so uh, we can think it like that, that uh, uh, yeah, we can give this grieving time for a particular thing, but then we have to move on uh, so that our body yes. is not affected. Good question, good example. Actually, say, not lamenting or not grieving, what is not shoka, no shoka is talk about the characteristic of your devotee. So there is a 
<clears throat> there are many letters of Prabhupada where he expresses emotions. So there's a devotee who left, a prominent leader who left the movement and Prabhupada wrote a letter saying that, I come to know about this, this about you, and I am feeling very forlorn. Now, forlorn is quite a poetic English word which means utterly lonely and desolated and deserted. And then towards the end of the letter, Prabhupada expresses the result that I am, I, am, I am determined to spread Lord Chaitanya's mission and I am sure Lord Chaitanya will send souls to exist for If not you, then someone else. So Prabhupada expresses the emotion. There is another like, uh, conversation where Prabhupada is in India, 76 or 77. And then a reporter asks uh, Prabhupada that many organizations that are founded by a guru, after their guru departs, the organization breaks down. So, do you think this will happen to your movement? And then Prabhupada replies, why are you discouraging me? No, no, Swami, I'm not discouraging you, I'm just asking a question. No, but your question is discouraging. <laughs> now, can Prabhupada be discouraged? You could say that Prabhupada is a person who single-handedly overcame all discouragements no help from his god brothers, no help from the Indian government, no financial support, nothing. He overcame hundreds of discouragements and still persevered, went to the West and established Krishna consciousness. So, uh, how can Prabhupada be discouraged simply by a question being asked? The point here is that actually it's not that Prabhupada doesn't experience that emotion. But that emotion doesn't determine his action. In one sense, you could say determination means to keep our intention above our emotion. You can't deny the emotion. You do feel the emotion. Yes, I feel angry. I feel hurt. I feel discouraged. I feel lonely. But my purpose, my intention is above all this. So there are emotions which we all experience, but we don't let those emotions shape our actions. Okay. Yes, Uh, limb that he was quoting, uh, it says, not giving in to extreme emotions. Oh, great point. So, Thank you. Yes. So, we move on to the last part now. We're going to talk about. Straight with the story. Please put this in silent. It's the same as do not disturb. Does anyone know the text silent person? So say God of the So <coughs> Okay. So the last point I was going to speak on is that how does all this apply in the in the renounced order, the brahmachari life? Generally, when we embrace the renounced order, <coughs> at one level, if we <coughs> disconnect ourselves from almost all of our material relationships. And that, what we are doing is, is the determination that decision is glorious. At the same time, our, we still remain people with emotions and those emotions can't be denied. Now there are different kinds of emotions and some emotions uh, we need to keep a distance from them. In the Ramayana there is a beautiful incident where, where <coughs> when Lakshman sees Bharat coming into the forest with the army. He becomes furious and he thinks Bharat has come to with the army to kill Ram. And he says, I will kill Bharat before he can kill him. But then when he finally sees how 
Bharat is so fervently begging to Ram, please come back to the kingdom. And then Ram refuses, then he says, please give me your footwear. And today if two brothers are fighting, if one brother refuses footwear to the other brother, the other brother will probably take it and beat the brother with it. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then he sees how Bharat takes the footwear, put it on his head and goes. He's very touched. He's very, he's repentant of his initial angry outburst against Bharat. So then he asks Ram in a private moment afterwards, why do I get angry so quickly? And Ram replies that you are sentimental. So then Lakshman asks, so is it a sentiment bad? And Ram replies, no, sentiments are not bad. The so sentiments are the ornaments of life. But said, we need to choose those sentiments that take us towards dharma and avoid those sentiments that take us away from dharma. So emotions are the ornament of life. We can't live without emotions. But we can choose which emotions we nourish. And which emotions we pay, don't pay attention to. So for all of us, we need a sense of connection. We need, the, the need for relationships doesn't go away just because we adopt the renounced order. So that need has to be fulfilled. And fulfilling that need of relationships, there, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be with, through marriage with a partner. But we need that, we have that, we, have, we need to get that need fulfilled. And so we need close relationships. And when you say close relationships, generally speaking what happens, most of the uh, seminars or talks that we have on relationships, they end with the idea that we should not offend devotees, we should cooperate with devotees, we should live together. That basically means that don't have bad relationships. Which is important, no doubt. But actually we need to have very close relationships also. If not with many, at least with one person. Somewhere where we can share our heart. And now, how does this happen? It's not that we can just, we can just automatically develop a relationship. It requires like-mindedness. Like-mindedness means that the word like-minded can have many different meanings. But the meaning which I found most relevant is that where we share a definition of success with someone else. Share a definition of success. In bhakti there can be different definitions of success. For somebody to build a big temple for Krishna. That is their definition of success. For somebody, distributing books is their definition of success. For somebody, studying Shastra and understanding deeply Shastra, that is their definition of success. For somebody, making a lot of people into devotees is their definition of success. And this definition of success, Prabhupada is so inclusive, Krishna, the Krishna movement is so, Krishna Bhakti movement is so inclusive that there can be many, many different definitions of success. But we need to connect with someone with whom, it's not that both of us have only the same definition of success, but we share a definition. So if somebody loves to study Shastra, then they need the association of someone else with whom they can discuss Shastra. And they can discuss Shastra in a way, not in an instructive way, but in a way that is relished. They speak something, you speak something, and then that's how the Dada, that Bodhayantaha Parasparam happens. <coughs> if somebody is trying to do some other service, say, deity worship somebody is doing. And they need somebody else with whom they can dis detect, discuss deity worship. Not just somebody who comes and says, oh, beautiful decoration of deities, beautiful dressing. No, beyond that, there has to be much more meaningful discussion. So this is something which each one of us has to take responsibility 
to find that association. So, I was introduced primarily because I was intellectually attracted to Krishna Bhakti. I appreciate the philosophy very much. And the intellectual side is quite strong. <laughs> and after a particular point of time, I found that I had many questions which were not only not getting answered, but which were not even being entertained. <laughs> <laughs> So, you now one of the most frustrating things for us in spiritual life is we act a practical question, we ask a practical question, and we are given a transcendental answer. <laughs> <laughs> Say, if we are facing a practical problem, you know, you know, there's, it's cold and we don't get warm water in the bathroom. You know, chant Hare Krishna. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> there, there is a practical problem. Yes, there is a transcendental solution also is there. But there need to be a practical solution also. So I remember I once I asked a senior devotee some questions. And his answer was, why do you have so many questions? <laughs> I said, what do you mean? <laughs> I, was, I felt so ununderstood at that time. <laughs> then another devotee I asked some questions. And he quoted. Yes, they were parabhaktir. If you just have faith in Guru and Krishna, everything will be answered. Nice but I said, okay, but everything is not being answered. Maybe I don't have faith, but what do I do right now? <laughs> Isn't it? So I realized that at that time, I, the way I was analyzing, the way I was discussing, I realized that I need somebody who who thinks that same way. And that was the time when I got in touch with some devotees who were not so much from, I was in Pune Ashram, they are not from the Pune Ashram, they are not even from Chopadi. They were devotees who were scholars, who were writing books, who were studying the broad tradition. And then I connected with them by, by email, then I went and met them, started asking questions. And then I discovered that, okay, that but the questions that I was having, I was I've been practicing bhakti for 10 years, and they have been practicing for 30 years, and they are also battling with the same questions. It's not that it's a black and white case that this is the answer and you have to accept it. No, they are also they are also com coming up with some understanding. Sometimes they would give an understanding to satisfy me. Sometimes they would not they would not satisfy me. Sometimes they would also say that I also not found a satisfactory answer to this question. One senior devotee told me that when I read Prabhupada's books. He said that there are, you know, there are so many places, I just put them in double quotes. You know, this is a question which I need to address. So I found that you could have those doubts, you could have a way to address those doubts, but you could continue practicing bhakti. Because many of those doubts, they are there, and especially if somebody is intellectual, they need to be addressed. But it is not that we have to stop practicing our bhakti just because the doubt is not there. We can find the appropriate places where the questions can be answered. So, at that time, maybe for one or two years when I didn't connect with this devotee, then I felt completely disconnected from the devotees around me. I was, I was very lonely. But fortunately, Krishna arranged for me to get connected. But what it struck me at that time is that I had to take that responsibility myself. It's, it is my need and maturity means to understand that nobody is obliged to fulfill my need. That doesn't mean nobody will fulfill my need. But maturity means to understand that nobody is obliged to fulfill my need. It's like normal growing up. <clears throat> when a baby is small, at that time, the baby cries and the world runs to feed that baby. And the mother comes, the father comes, the grandmother comes, somebody comes and takes care of the baby. But if that baby grows up to a young, young person and say a young man starts crying, and nobody will run to feed that young man. That doesn't mean that the young man's hunger is not real. That doesn't mean the young man's need is not real. But maturity means the, young, 
the mature person understands that nobody is obliged to fulfill me. I have to get my need fulfilled. Okay. I have to I have to go somewhere where I can get food. I have to go the food. Maybe I have to work and earn money so that I can get I can get my uh, get food. So similarly for us, we all whatever is our particular <coughs> need, fulfilling it is our responsibility. And to the extent we recognize this, to that extent we will take ownership for developing relationships. It, that means if I find that there is some devotee with whom I can connect very nicely, then at that time I have to make time, I have to go out of the way, I have to, I have to, I have to do what it takes to develop the relationship. And when we do this, then we will feel we will feel emotionally also nourished. So in this case, of course, I was talking about intellectual doubts being addressed, but it was not just intellectual. It was not so much that I needed answers. I needed the questions to be understood. The fact that somebody can have questions and that doesn't mean that person is a doubter. So similarly, each of us will have particular concerns. And we have to find out like-minded association where we can connect. And to give an extreme example of this, that I mean, I said, it is for us to take responsibility. Say just like if a boy wants to develop a relationship with a girl, and the boy goes out of the way to court the girl, to date with the girl, to spend time with her, to please her. So there. The boy takes the responsibility to develop the relationship. So, now that we are not talking about that in the literal sense, but the principle here is that in material life, we take responsibility to develop the relationship. We take the initiative. So similarly, we need to do that in our situations also. And then, what is our need? How do we find that out? We conclude with this two points now. First is that, we look at our life and look at the time when we felt most satisfied. Not just through an achievement, but through some interaction. What are the things that make us feel most satisfied? And what are the things which if someone does not do, we feel most dissatisfied? So if you look at these two things, in, a, in, in our social circle with devotees, if somebody does this for me, if some of us may feel that, I just, if we go out for preaching, we go out for doing some service, and then some senior devotee comes and appreciates all oh, your wonderful service, and that makes me feel satisfied. Or, after I come back, I just need someone with whom I can talk and share my experiences. And then it's about our struggles, our successes. And then if somebody just is willing to spend some quality time with me, then I feel satisfied. So if I'm tired and somebody just keeps a plate on the side for me, at that time I feel, oh, somebody cares for me. So these are all and just very simple examples, but this I'm just giving this as a point to illustrate that we all can look, try to understand what our emotional needs are by looking at what makes us feel loved, valued, cared and what doesn't make, what makes us feel unloved, unvalued, uncared. And then once we understand that, we can find out who can satisfy. I love to discuss philosophy and I have seen that uh, there are some devotees who are more in the mood of doers. <laughs> just do this, do this, do this. For them, philosophy is also a tool for giving classes and converting people. Philosophy is not so much a tool for discussion. So then, I cannot really connect much with them. 
and there are some devotees with whom I can sit and discuss Shastra and philosophy and its application for hours and hours together. Every year when I go to America, I make it a, I make it a point at least once to go to meet Giraj Maharaj. And Giraj Maharaj, usually when I go there, now usually almost he is very kind to me. We spend almost six to eight hours just continuously discussing philosophy. <coughs> so one time he started around uh, after lunch or something, he started around one o'clock, <coughs> two o'clock, and almost till ten o'clock we were discussing. Of course, we are uh, now. I felt so touched by that, and I wrote a long mail to Maharaj appreciating it. And then Maharaj wrote back to me something very striking. I said, Maharaj, you are so kind, you are so compassionate, you are extending yourself so much to give association. So Maharaj said that, he said that actually, uh, the exact words he used. He basically said that there is some association which, which takes our energy and there is some association which gives energy. So he basically we discuss about his he's a writer, he's a writer, I am also a writer editor. So we discuss about his writing, different ways of writing, what can be done, what 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 is how to go about writing. So he said that the kind of discussions that we have, there are not many people with whom I can have this discussion. And I also love it. Now, I'm not saying this to say that I am a very advanced devotee. This is spiritual advancement, Maharaj is way, way light years I was. But it's just that somehow I was able to connect. We are able to connect. And when you are able to connect, then that need is there that is fulfilled. So, the, it's, it's not, uh, it's for us, each one of us. So for me, I find that if I can sit and discuss philosophy deeply, not just in terms of asking questions and getting answers, but honestly addressing issues, that nourishes me. And those who are ready to do that, I'm ready to go way out of my way to spend time with them. So whatever is our need, if we, so when I go to America and I come back, more than the classes that I give, often it is this, this kind of quality discussion that I have with people. That is what nourishes me more. That is what I feel enriched by. And so basically these two things, if we look at what what makes us feel unloved, unvalued, uncared? And what makes us feel loved, valued, and cared? Then accordingly, we can find out how best to take care of our emotional needs. And once we start taking care of our emotional needs, many things in our spiritual life will start falling in place. We'll start finding that our chanting will become better, our overall attitude towards devotees in general will become better, our attitude towards our sadhana, will, uh, our self seva will also be better. The emotional need is not addressed, then we will feel choked constantly. And that that fe that choke feeling will impede everything in our spiritual life. Now I'm not saying addressing emotional need is like a magic wand that will solve all problems. It is only Krishna consciousness that is the ultimate magic wand. But just as, say, if, uh, if we are sitting and doing japa, and our back is paining, now, if there's a little pain, we can tolerate it and still chant. But if the pain is too much, then we can't chant. We may have to do some massage or apply something to it, and then we can chant after that. So similarly, with respect to emotional needs, if they're not addressed, then we'll find that they will constantly keep interfering with our Krishna consciousness. And we'll not be really conscious of Krishna. But if the emotional needs are addressed, then we can connect with Krishna in a way which is not impeded by our emotions, but rather our emotions aid us in connecting with Krishna. So I'll summarize. I spoke three main points today. I spoke about how <clears throat> the body, mind and soul, the body, mind and soul, these are all distinct levels of reality. At one level we differentiate them and understand that I'm not the body, I'm not the mind. But at another level, we integrate them in our emotional purpose. The body and the mind are essential for transcending the body and the mind by using them in Krishna's service. 
And therefore, whatever we experience at the physical and mental level, we can't just wish it away. We have to address it appropriately. And that means that we don't let the body, physical or mental, just be one extreme is to get carried away by it, another is to suppress it. But the more balanced approach is to process it. So, using our intelligence, we can understand which emotions come from the situation, which from the disposition, and which from a combination of both. Then I give a scriptural examples where emotions are not wished away. Whether it is Draupadi's anger at her dishonor or Arjuna's anger at this woman you being killed. The point is that philosophy is not used to wish away emotions. There is a time to educate and there is a time to commiserate. The point is not that we don't educate the point or commiserate. The point is that we help people deal with their emotion in the most effective way. And when emotion, when our spirituality is not emotionally healthy, then we get choked by negative emotions. We start become irritable and we start um, feeling disheartened, lonely, uncared. And then last point I talked about was that um, that we need to address our emotional needs even when we are in the announced order. And maturity means to understand that no one is obliged to fulfill our needs. We have to take responsibility for finding out like-minded devotees, devotees who share a definition of success with us. And then we have to take responsibility to put the time and energy to connect with them and to, to share our heart with them. And to understand what our emotional need is, we can look at what it is that uh, we f what when it's not done, it makes us feel very unloved, unvalued, uncared. And what when done, we feel very valued, loved, and cared. And by by taking care of our emotional needs, we'll find that uh, the mind and the emotions interrupting us in our practice of Krishna consciousness will become significantly lesser and we will move forward in our spiritual life. So any questions or comments? Yes, please. So the like-minded association sometimes could be, uh, of course, sharing the same definition of success, but it could also be like a complementary <coughs> relationship, like a hearer and speaker, teacher and student kind of relationship also one likes to hear, one likes to speak. Oh yes, when I say share definition, when I say that share a definition of success, it could be that the teacher and the student both say religious philosophy. So then both of them discuss philosophy. One of them might be more of the speaker, the other might be the listener. But both of them share the definition of their relationship. Sometimes it may be that, say a devotee who is a book distributor and a devotee who is a pujari. They might also uh, find that they are like-minded. If even the book distributor is not doing much duty worship, and the duty worship pujari is not doing much uh, book distribution. But if they both have a healthy, hearty appreciation for each other's service, then they might be able to connect. So that means both of them understand that both of these are definitions of success. I appreciate this definition, we also appreciate this definition. Not appreciate just in a formal, institutional kind of way, but really feel this is very valuable. Okay, I'm not doing it right now, but it is value, invaluable. So, yeah, it could be. It doesn't have to be necessarily uh, a particular stereotype. But it's just that there has to be some mm, natural meeting point of two people. That natural meeting point, how it comes out, that can vary. So there are some things which we have to consciously exercise ourselves to focus and connect. We can do that as a service. Say if some devotee is describing about their service and we are not really interested in that so much. But as a service we may do that, but something we are naturally interested in. So there is a natural meeting point that has to be there. Okay? Yes, ma'am. You had a point? So what time should we stop? See, Balram should they do? Balram should, what time should we stop? Someone say 33 now. Okay.
Okay, no. Not up to me. Up to our class. <laughs> Yeah. Too long classes are not emotionally healthy. <laughs> so, okay, one question, one more question, two questions. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna said you should find the area of satisfaction and dissatisfaction. Uh, in Bhagavad Gita, Lord says, Antasukha Antara. So, what is the meaning of Antasukha Antara? And other person he says, Bodhayam Gita was and how do you define how okay. things? And secondly, generally, is when you see satisfaction, we find something external activities. When saying or uh, discussing a dimension. That means that is not ever you are not satisfaction. Exactly what how how do you define satisfaction? Okay. So Krishna at one point says that you should be internally satisfied on the Supantara Ramas. 5.24 and then he says also more than the plus 10.9. So when you say we should be satisfied, is it that we should be should some activities that we do or is it that we are internally satisfied? <coughs> See generally when we talk about internal and external, that is broadly in the context of material and spiritual. If externally there are some sense of objects which we are using to gratify ourselves and which take us much more into bodily consciousness, into material consciousness, <laughs> then it is, it is a problem. As I said, in bhakti, the world is a resource to, for us to reach the source. That means that even when we are practicing bhakti, we often choose the externals that help us to go towards the internals. So we encourage people to come to the association of devotees, come to a temple, come to a satsang. Satsang isn't the external, it is external, but it is the external that guides us towards the internals. If somebody goes to a bar or a disco, that's also external, but that's external which will direct them more towards the sensual, more towards the physical, more towards the material. So there are certain external settings which can take us towards the internal. So internal ultimately means not just the soul but Krishna. And Krishna is manifested everywhere, is within and he is without us. He is present as a deity, he is present within us as a super soul. And he is present in so many manifestations. So if we use the word external and internal literally, then being internally satisfied would mean that we are just alone and uncaring about our external situations. We are satisfied. But if we use the external and internal to refer to external as getting a material, physical, sensual and internal meaning becoming spiritual, becoming devotional, becoming connected with Krishna, then whatever it takes for us, we do to connect with Krishna. In fact, we could say preaching at one level is external activity. Isn't it? If we were just internally satisfied, then why would we at all try to preach? Now, in preaching also there is a amount of internal satisfaction. That means when I give a class, uh, if a lot of people come for a class, that's wonderful. But even if not many people come, just the opportunity to speak about Krishna is also nourishing. So, there is, even while doing externals, we could be internally satisfied. <laughs> but the external gives us a forum by which we can uh, move towards internals. By a forum by which we can move, uh, uh, we can grow internally. We can connect with Krishna. So, both, when Krishna says be internally satisfied, if we can reach this, we can connect with the super soul internally, and we can absorb Krishna internally, and that's the idea of being internally satisfied. If by the association of devotees, we connect with Krishna, we become conscious of Krishna, then that is also wonderful. So the point is, we have to connect with Krishna. Okay? Thank you. Yes, last question. So, as you discussed that uh, uh, emotions 
that can can do a three ways from this position and this position and of uh, situation in both. So I have some practical goals for couple of years are still going up. Uh, more clarity, clarity, so I have, I have practiced those things. So when somebody uh, choose a renounced order, I'm um, like practicing, I'll promise you as from the sort of some sort of a understanding or uh, to this life I should give this no service. According to this position of situation based, just practice. It's easy to choose or change ourselves one, two, three years for understanding. But sometimes it's very, uh, for me, sometimes feel after 10 years, 15 years, and uh, suddenly changing as well. Changing as not bad, but still uh, in, in, in the unfavorable condition or in, in a bad situation, one should take more circular condition now uh, and more intolerance power. Rather, Whatever may be on earth or maybe mindset or whatever. And one life keep on Krishna. So how the cycle changes, how to understand why this is happening actually. All the theory, all the knowledge, all the assessment that time fails. Mean that somebody counseling why you're changing after twenty years like that. Only two twenty years is left. Life on sixty, sixty, seventy years. Now you are forty five. So it will solve. So how to understand? So why is it that we can't just give one life for Krishna that after 20 years or 10 years of practicing bhakti and you only have 20 years more years but we have to change the ashram. That's some people feel the need to change the ashram. See, at one level to say give one life to Krishna is, it sounds very nice but one life is a very long time. <laughs> While we are living it. <laughs> While we are living it, even one day can seem a very long time also. So, there is, uh, there is the reality which we, each one of us is to deal with the way it comes out. And uh, with respect to why certain desires may come at particular times, we shouldn't see that necessarily as a failure of the bhakti practice. That's important. That, uh, Ultimately, the ashram that we choose is a material choice. It's not necessarily directly a spiritual choice. Or not directly a, it's a devotional choice. There can be people who, there can be mayavadis who have no devotion for Krishna and they may have renunciation. So, people say, okay, they are detached. Uh, but there are there are material, there are people. One of the most prominent atheists. <coughs> he he remained single throughout his life. So you know, sometimes some people just by their past karma might have a certain level of sattva by which they can practice. Uh, they don't feel the need for a relationship of that of the of that kind. At one level, just as we understand that artha, you know, say Krishna has his opulences, wealth is one of the opulences, uh, knowledge is one of the opulences, similarly, renunciation is also one of the opulences. Some people are born wealthy, some people are born poor. Born. Why is that? That's because of past God. Similarly, renunciation is also something which some people may get from their past, something they will not get from their past. Of course, Things could be a little more subtle that Vasudev Bhagavati Bhakti or Prayavita Janayatya Ashwairakim Yanam Jayavitaka. That by the practice of bhakti also renunciation will happen. So when a particular person is developing renunciation, uh, is that renunciation or is adopting the renounced order? That could be because that person has had the karma for renunciation from his previous life. That means they, they have that opulence, just like some people have wealth, some people have good looks, some people have great brain power, jnana, some people like that may have renunciation. One of my friends, he's just studying astrology and he did a, he did an astrological chart of many of the famous sannyasis in our movement as well as outside. 
and he he pointed out how all of them in the astrological indication they had a lot of vairagya but then he also talked about some and some people in the north world who did not have much vairagya but still they were also vairagyas so sometimes it's so, so sometimes it may be possible that by the power of bhakti also one may be able to do that but we shouldn't see that that somebody has practiced bhakti but they are not developed now they they are not in the dance world or they are not even meant in the dance world but it's not necessarily that that everybody who practices bhakti will go to the dance world in the past there were so many grahas the majority of these grahas this so there is renunciation there is a renounced order somebody can have renunciation but they may not have the renunciation suited for being in the dance world they might be grahas or also they might be renounced ones so why i am giving this point is that just like a person may be born wealthy but by their karma they might lose wealth at a particular time by fast karma they might just go through a phase where their their wealth goes down and then after some time their wealth may come back so similarly if you understand that renunciation is also uh, a gift it's something which we may get by past karma but of course we may develop it also by present bhakti so that so our it could be in some way that our present bhakti practice are efficient and that's why those desires are coming up again but it could also be that we are going through a phase in our life where the renunciation is just going down it will come back again the important thing is not so much to ask not so much to so be judgmental in thinking in terms of success and failure it's more in terms of thinking about what is effective what works best for me but how can i best serve krishna and if one has that understanding then one can non judgmentally choose how best we can serve krishna sometimes you know we just find that the dissatisfaction that we are facing the desire that we are facing they might just be because we are exposing ourselves to tempting situations unnecessarily we are going into a service which uh, may be not be the best for us so we change our situation come out of that tempting situations and then we find that we can go forward quite nicely sometimes it may be that our desires may be just distorted expressions expressions of some unfulfilled need that means that say for example this is this is how our desires emerge that is quite a elaborate subject of study nowadays because of the addictions that are hugely consuming society so it's found that when a person starts abusing alcohol they say that first the drinker takes a drink then the drink takes the drink and then the drink takes the drinker <laughs> that means the desire keeps growing 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 so why would somebody start drinking sometimes it may be that they are just they just feel lonely and drinking is a means by which they hang out with people that's why people are called as social drinkers so if their society if their social circle changes and they can get a sense of belonging to a social circle without needing to drink they stop drinking so their need is not alcohol their need is a sense of belonging for some people it might be just that uh, whenever they feel stressed whenever they feel disturbed they need a escape way and <coughs> alcohol is their escape way <coughs> and so so there is a healthy need that is okay I'm tired i need some food <laughs> but the unhealthy express way for that unhealthy escape way for that is drinking so it's not just a matter of will power at that I'll not drink I'll not drink I'll not drink let to find out how can i address this need how can i find a health more healthier more holistic escape way for myself we need relief so some people might find music some people might find meditation some people might find it in whatever it is the people may find physical activity just over a physically vigorous workout so may jogging whatever and they find a escape way that some people just find it is boxing 
is box your hand around of yourself like this. So this is there is a need and there is a craving. So the craving is unhealthy, but the need is need is naturally healthy. So uh, we have to find out what need is there to be addressed. Or sometimes after 20 years, when uh, certain desires start surfacing, that we have to look back at what need is not being fulfilled. There's no guarantee that when we start practicing bhakti, the whatever desires we have, they will go down necessarily literally linear. The desires will go down. But it is also that when the desire pops up again, what is the reason it has popped up? It's not just simply that I'm not practicing bhakti nicely. It could be that there's something else which is uh, jam backing and uh, which uh, is a new journey to fulfill. So once we look at this in a more objective way, that means, ob objective means rather than going judgmental, oh, I am so fallen, I am so sinful, I am so lusty, I am so that, no. Yes, all those are, that's one way of looking at it. But another way of looking at this, okay. Just look at ourselves from the point of view, what you call, call it, social scientist. Now, who is this person? If this person is done like this, just try to observe ourselves from a third person's perspective. Look at ourselves from outside, and say, okay, what is this person going through? And then try to understand ourselves better. So sometimes our desires, uh, instead of battling with them, of course, sometimes some desires have to be battled with. But we can use our desires as tools to, or as stimuli for understanding ourselves better. And once we understand ourselves better, then actually we can go through life much more smoothly. Which ashram we go through, that is something which will be eventually decided. But rather than seeing the re-emergence of a desire simply as a failure of our bhakti, we can see the re-emergence of a particular desire as a pointer, for, as a prompt for deeper self-understanding. Okay. Yes, please. Sometimes the institutional taboos sort of uh, uh, shade our uh, force our introspection in a particular direction which may not be the best course of introspection. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Sometimes the institutional taboos may force us to introspect also in a particular direction. Yeah, I remember I met Ramdhi Sarupro in America. And he was telling me that in the early days of Krishna consciousness movement, they had the idea that if you live in the temple, you are transcendental. <coughs> if you live in, near the temple, you are in the mode of goodness. If you live a little away from the temple, you are in the mode of passion. If you live far away from the temple, you are in the mode of ignorance. So the transcendental was reduced to the geographical. <laughs> so they had the idea that if anybody left the temple, even if they are practicing bhakti outside, they felt that you can say that he has fallen down. And whenever anybody would have a fall down like that, in that definition, they would still be practicing bhakti. But then he said, all of us would come together. And now he may be, he may be exaggerating his humility, but he said, all of us would come together and collectively point out the faults of that person. Because of which that person fell down. And then we would pat ourselves on the back, everything is fine with us, and let's go on with our so now, it's not necessary to, uh, he says that is, different people have different needs and different people practice bhakti differently. So sometimes, there is a great tendency to try to prove ourselves right. So, uh, the capacity for self-criticism requires a level of honesty, which is not easy to have both at an individual level and an institutional level. So that doesn't that means that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, that it's not possible. But we have to find out who 
with whom we can do this kind of honest introspection. There are certain certain people who have very black and white understanding of empathy. And with them, if we start raising certain questions, then they just dismiss us as deviants or doubters or whatever. Uh, there are others who have more nuanced understanding of empathy. Uh, the, there is there are some people who who treat people as put an extreme word for this they treat people as guinea pigs for their ideological experiments and this is what has to be done and if you are not doing it you are wrong but if you understand that it's people are not it's it's like a how do you put it mm, are people meant for the process or is process meant for the people ultimately it is that everything is meant for krishna but what does krishna want is it that krishna wants uh, that uh, Krishna wants everyone to become devotees. Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said that one devotee is more precious in the whole universe. So it's like uh, I was at a hospital in America uh, where I was giving a talk and after that um, one person came and talked with me and we had a lot of good talks on medical ethics. So what happens is that sometimes a particular treatment doesn't work. Not because the treatment is wrong but that say in particular people with particular backgrounds, some people may have some particular chemical deficiency, they may not have vitamins, they may not have this, they may not have that. So now when that medicine, that particular treatment is not working in a particular person, either we could somehow, if a person is an expert doctor, expert, not expert in terms of expert researcher or expert in that field, they can just blame it all this, this, this thing went wrong and that's why it didn't work. But somebody who is more honest and more compassionate, it's okay, this treatment is not working yet. So our goal is not just to prove that this treatment is right. Yeah, the treatment is right, it has worked for many people. But it's not working with this person. Maybe not just this people, but this community of people. People from this background, people with this diet, people for this whatever. So then what do we need to do to make sure that this treatment works for these people? So we have to see similarly that some people are more concerned with doing the treatment right than healing the patient. Mm -hmm. Some people are concerned, yes we accept the treatment is right, but we are also concerned that this treatment is not healing the patient. So what do we need to do to heal the patient? So that honesty, sometimes if somebody is in a hospital, and they are very concerned about the prestige of the hospital. Then somebody has say invented a particular medicine, a pharmacy company invented a particular medicine, and they said this is the cure for this disease, and it's not working. It can like become a big scam where they try to cover up all the negative results, and they prop up only the positive results. So now it, that is just that is a commercial material example, but something similar may happen. Some devotees are more concerned with the process. This is what we have to follow. Yes, we have to follow. But there is a result that is to come. And the result is not coming. Then, then we have to see what needs to be done. Maybe something needs to be adjusted. Prabhupada was very practical. You know, I was mentioned I'm talking to Raj Maharaj. So he, he, he told me that he was talking to Shutakirti Prabhu. I was doing a program with Shutakirti Prabhu. And somebody asked Shutakirti Prabhu, what was the... <coughs> What is the quality of Prabhupada that you like the most? And Shudhagiri Guru said, I have never found any person as practical as Shudhagiri When you say it's practical, really that greater quality, they say that, oh, Prabhupada is a pure devotee, Prabhupada is such a vigorous preacher, Prabhupada is this. Practical means Prabhupada did what worked. And if something did work, Harinam Sankirtan is the core of our process. But when the devotees are doing Harinam Sankirtan in Bengal, people started throwing coins at you. 
because in Bengal there is there is Vaishnavism at that time was considered like a poor man's uh, a beggar's excuse for begging. So people would be, so Prabhupada said we don't want to be lumped with them. And Prabhupada said, at that time stop stop keep them itself. Not in the temples, but at that in public services keep them. So Prabhupada is practical in doing what was needed to serve Krishna's purpose. So we have to find out who will help us. So the introspection can be, going back to your point, okay, is the process not being followed right? We have to check that also. But we also have to check this patient is not getting healed. So what could be what could what could be the situation? And how do I deal with that? So some people like with this word of the karma theory, there's a, one one critic says many people when people are suffering, many preachers they are more concerned with getting God off the hook than helping the hurting people. Don't blame God. God is not to be blamed. If a person is suffering, the important thing is not whether they blame God or not. The important thing is how do they deal with the suffering and grow from it. So our purpose is that we help people. Whatever it takes to help them, we do that. And uh, if some people are not ready to have that kind of honest <coughs> introspection, then we have to find who is ready to do that. And there are, there are devotees who are also ready to do that. So just have to find those devotees and then connect with them. Okay. So thank you very much. Shri Prabhupada Ki. Yeah.